for you, if you guys that have listened to the show for a while, you know how much of a fan I am of Dr. Rubenstein. How, you know, I went to go see her play alongside uh, Roy Perez at Mixed Garage, you know, and my life maybe changed for the better. Reading an interview with her. I kind of discovered her through reading an interview with her um, on um, Electronic Beats, te Telecom, that kind of German-based um, online techno magazine. It's really cool. I recommend you check it out. They did a really good feature with her. And she kind of came across like, you know, as she kind of came across as a DJ that I'd kind of be a friend with. I'm a big fan of DJs that enjoy themselves. Or No, I'm, I'm a big fan of DJs who are ravers before they got into DJing. Right? I'm a big fan of the, the club kid like I was. You know, I used to go to all the... I used to go to Plastic People. I used to go to Village Underground. I used to go to all these kind of, you know, historical... Um, London venues, Fabric, whatever you may be called, all back in the day when I first got into electronic music, and that's how I kind of discovered my love for it. You know, understanding there's someone behind the booth, dictating the soundscape of the actual room, reading the crowd, you know, super well, and just delivering in a killer set. And then you're like, fuck, how do I get into that? And then you slowly go into the whole warm hole over it. But that's where I like to kind of come into it, not the kind of producer side and then DJing, you know, to get some, you know, to get more exposure for your tunes or to make more money. I'm in it for the clubbing experience and she's you know a, a quintessential uh, raver who turned her passion to dj and again one of my favorites out on the scene now a real good party vibe and the whole feature is really cool um it's the uh, resident advisors art of djing where they kind of highlight djs and kind of ask them you know go, go into their whole practice how they go about djing how they select their tunes their kind of outlook on life it's a really really good interview um there's a quote on here that i really liked i'm going to read out here that i kind of think um really kind of personified where i'm at, at the moment i think it's a quote about ego See if I can find it. Uh, it was on here. Ego. Yeah, there you go. Um, I think this is a really good uh, point that I wanted to kind of emphasize on here, right? So I've got it here on the screen. You guys to see. But I'll link it for the show notes if you guys listen to it via audio. But here it says my favorite quote from, the, from uh, the whole interview. The question is, let's say I'm a new DJ. Uh, this is to Dr. Rubenstein, of course. Let's say I'm a new DJ and who hasn't played out very much. What would you tell me to do in order to connect to my crowd? And um, Dr. Rubenstein responds, I guess the first thing I would recommend is something I do myself, or at least I try to do every time I DJ. When I enter the DJ booth, I leave my ego outside. It's easy to get wrapped up in trying to show people that, you're good, that, you, that you've got or that what you've got or to go look cool or to be admired or praised. I try to remember that I am there to serve the party along with the people on the dance floor and the people who work in the club. The moment you really make it about not you really make it not about yourself but about the party in general and when you want to make it happen together with others, I guess that's how you start to connect with the crowd. I realized recently that I had been thinking the way this way implicitly before I play, which is amazing quote, right? Because I think there is this thinking especially when you're a new dj or especially maybe if you're even uh, on the way to becoming a bit more established there is maybe this idea that you should start to carve your own identity and start to forego what the what the crowd want in terms of trying to make sure you pursue or you get across your artistic vision of what you want to represent right you want to make sure what you're saying is what you're saying unfiltered all the way through but i do think there's an aspect of djing similar to you know the heady days of studio 51 or the loft in new york right where there was this you know there was this idea that they you were going into spaces and they were going to sh show you or they were going to subject you to a musical journey right this is the stuff that i'm into listen and enjoy but it also was a bit of a call and response part of it right in terms of like reading the crowd giving them what they want giving them what they didn't know they didn't want and kind of having that dance you know back and forth back and forth back and forth which is what is pretty this which is what kind of separates it from a gig if you're a band right if you're a band you know for sure when you go see someone play like the Running Stones, they're going to go through some of the hits, they're going to go through some of the new records, but you kind of know where it's going to go. But with a DJ, I think that the added benefit that you have is that you have the ability to kind of riff, right? To kind of go off course a bit and kind of come back on course a bit and kind of, you know, play around a bit. And I just think for me going forward, I've, I've been very conscious of providing, again, of providing a good time, of making sure everyone has a good time because I just know, I know how it is to be on the other side. I know how it is to walk into, especially because the places I'm playing in aren't necessarily nightclubs, right? They're just, you know, random bars in um in um east london and stuff right but um i think i'll do the same with nightclubs anyway i think we've all been random bars and pubs where you d you just went there to go meet a friend you didn't know dj was going to be playing all of a sudden dj starts playing and they ruin your night right they just start playing too loud they're playing weird music stuff that doesn't make sense for the timing just you know just throws it throws you off a bit it's sort of like um when a really shitty band plays in the pub, right? It just kind of ruins the whole evening, right? They have to be really good, right? This is not... And of course, if you know anything, you know, if you know anything about dad pub bands, you know that they're not good, right? They're a bit shit. So you're hoping... 
so so you know it's, it's unlikely you're going to find a, a good one so then when you do find a good one playing in a bar or a pub you're like fuck you're appreciative of it because they're not ruining your night they're an accompaniment to your night they're adding they're adding a soundtrack to your evening they're not just pile driving you with you know edm or dubstep at 9 p.m in, um, in the evening they're really trying to guide you through the night and they actually essentially you can tell they're trying to make you stay as long as possible and that's something i've kind of been really conscious of because i remember in the beginning when they used to play here in westfield and I'll start usually from seven. I remember it being like, you know, I remember from seven to nine is where I started to lose people, right? So I started to really thin out the herd. Everyone started to go home. And at one point there was that, you know, common thinking that a lot of st- new stand-up comedians do where if you have a really bad set, there's, you know, and it kind of, you know, it really dents your ego. There's a part of you that's like, oh, man, they don't really get what I'm doing, man. They don't understand my vision. And you kind of poo-poo it and you kind of put it to one side. But there is a, also a part of you that's deep down. You're like, you know what? Then they're, they're going home because I, I did a bad job, right? I did a bad job. I need to understand them more. And I guess over time, as you get more mature as a DJ, you kind of get more confidence, even just an artist, what you do, you start to understand, you start to kind of, you start to um, cultivate a bit of humility, right? You start to understand, okay, I'm not as good as I thought I was. I could be, I, I could be better, but I'm not there at the moment. And sometimes you can be, you can be also good doing your own thing, but I just don't think everyone wants to just to hear your own thing sometimes. It depends what kind of level artist you are. But I think that, that give and take is something that's beautiful about DJ. So over time, with, with experience and you know, practice, I started to understand, I started to be able to read the room and I started to know what to play in order to make people stay and how to get them to hang around, hang around, hang around a bit more. And if I, even if I take the example and I extrapolate it to the bar in Leightonstone, um, I play there in the in Heathcote and start at nine at nine p.m. Usually I start right nine p.m. to one, and um, where I play is right in the middle of the bar. So on the left hand side is where the games room is, and then outside of the games room is the is the beer garden, right? Um, and obviously with this lovely weather, it's going to be fucking ram packed. So they usually close the beer garden at ten p.m. So I've got an hour from nine till ten, or let's say an hour and a half, nine till ten thirty to keep those people that are in the beer garden in the pub because usually when they come into the bar they usually just walk straight out and go home right so i have an hour and a half to kind of see how many people from that group of people that walk through the bar can i keep because usually when people when the security guard comes out says hey guys sorry we're going to close the beer garden now people are usually got all their stuff with them outside right so they usually what they do is they put their stuff on even if they even if they're going to change their mind and might stay in they put their stuff on and they start walking towards the door so you have to really capture their attention at that, that hour and 10 minutes that hour and a half, hour and a half. And I've been, and I've gotten better at doing it over the, over the time. I think sometimes I will start too slow. Sometimes I, was, I would be a bit too safe. But now I know what to play to kind of get their attention and then to kind of keep them there. And again, I think it's something that you only learn with humility, with e- with putting your ego to one side. Because if it was my ego was in the booth, I'd be like, nah, they should get it when they're walking past. They should understand what I'm playing. This is a fucking deep cut. They should know. You should stay. You can't, you're not going to hear this stuff anywhere else. But it's like, no. I'm there to serve them, right? And they're there to kind of serve me in some way, right? They're there to give me an idea of whether or not I'm going in the right direction or not. And I think over time, that's been something I've been very, very um, thankful for in terms of the little gigs I've been getting right now at the moment. They're not the most glamorous. They're not the most amazing. They're not the most, you know, crazy places. But what they do give the opportunity is to play every single week in front of a really captive audience, in front of people of a varying di- a varying background, varying different, various, varying uh, um, musical taste. And to try, try and get my kind of knowledge up and skill level up in terms of how to, um, how to um, o- overall kind of appeal to them going forward. And it's something I've kind of been really happy with. And again, I'm happy um, Dr. Rubenstein kind of mentioned the, the fact that, you know, not having an ego is the one that's really going to help you go forward.